I just left Camp 1. Uh, you see here Pomori. This one is Choyu. This here, what you see is Camp 1. And um, I'm on my way up to Camp 2. You see Lotze here, Everest here, Nupze up there. I'm surrounded by giants. My rucksack is pretty heavy. I'm quite tired. But uh, slowly, slowly, I'm getting to camp two. Maybe three more hours and I got it. Peace out. Hey guys, what is up? Uh, Nordine here again with another video. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Nordine. I'm from Germany. I am a mountaineer for about 10 to 13 years now, you could say. And um, last year I climbed my first 8000er the fourth highest mountain in the world called Lotze, right next to Mount Everest, uh, solo, without oxygen. Yeah, um, as I said, uh, Mount Lotze is uh, directly next to Everest. It's 8,560 meters high. It's uh, one of the more uh, challenging 8,000ers out there. And um, yeah, last year, I finally managed to to climb that uh, or my personal first 8000 mountain ever and um, it was a very 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 long journey to get there and to be able to stand on an 8000 summit all by myself solo completely alone and without supplementary oxygen um, but eventually I didn't start as an expert and um, well I'm, I still wouldn't call myself an expert uh, yet uh, because um, there's still so much to learn and uh, I still have a long journey ahead and um, I will develop even more in the future as a mountaineer and therefore um, I will also attempt to climb uh, Mount Everest uh, later this year in the spring season um, I have, have big plans for this season in 2024 and um, yeah, we'll try to get even more 8000ers uh, under my belt that I try to climb solo and without oxygen. But this sh uh, shall not be the story of today's video. Today's video is all about um, how I developed as a mountaineer, how I became a mountaineer how I exceeded my limits and uh, gathered and learned more skills every week, every month and yeah, how I um, exceeded my boundaries every time I went to the mountains. In the last episodes I um, told you how, how I started with mountaineering, how I climbed my very first mountain, how I did my very first solo. In the last episode, I told you how I climbed my very first 4,000 mountains in the in the high atlas in Morocco, um, with a lot of snow and uncertainties. And um, uh, in this episode, I actually want to continue the story of um, how I climbed all the 4,000ers in Morocco. Well, at least that was my plan. Um, there was a high atlas mountain range. I had um, about four weeks of time uh, during uh, the winter uh, of 2014 in December and my plan was to climb all 4000ers in the high atlas mountain range that I can find uh, in order to yeah develop to become a better mountaineer to gain more experience and to uh, refine my skills um, yeah, so if you're interested in that story and if you haven't seen it, um, yeah, check check the playlist and um, there you can see how I climbed my first 4000er. Um, yeah, I told you after I came back from the summit of uh, Jebel Tupkal, I met up again with Michal in the hut in the Refuge Tupkal and we were celebrating our success um, that day. He climbed two more 4000ers solo and I was on Tupkal. And we decided that we're gonna team up together and climb a few 4000ers together before he has to leave uh, and go uh, down the mountain again and fly back to, to the UK. So yeah, the next day, Michal and I, um, we met in the, in the, in the um, oven room, uh, had a little breakfast, uh, managed our rucksack and we decided, okay, let's try to climb three 4000ers in one day together which would namely be uh, acute a fella north and a fella south and maybe 
if we can manage uh, and go along the ridge uh, there's also another mountain called Bugenossen or something like that um, I don't have exact numbers about that mountain um, some literature says it's um, exactly 4,000 meters high it's 4,011 meters high some say it's only 3,900 something meters high well it doesn't even matter um, that were the, 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 the mountains we wanted to tackle for that day so yeah we got ready and again uh, during the night but um, close before uh, sunrise we started um, moving and started walking the sun, sun ca uh, slowly came up um, the sky was getting uh, gray already and we headed towards the south uh, along the valley uh, towards uh, the, the Lac Ifni and we knew uh, the summits we were looking for are somewhere on the right side. The only thing that we had was a map that I uh, possessed and Michal had photographs of the summits and of the, the routes um, where you have to take a turn or diverge and um, yeah we, we, we studied that material uh, the night before but yeah since everything was uh, covered in snow and both of us we were um, kind of greenhorns and uh, beginners uh, at mountaineering so we both both of us we really didn't know uh, where to go what we were doing and um, how to navigate the best but um, we did our best that we could with our intuition with uh, the map and the photographs we had and um, yeah with our with our will and our mental um, strength and desire to reach the summit so as i said we we headed along the valley and then um, you know, uh, there were several valleys opening to the right side and we were not 100% sure which one would be the right path to go. But um, yeah, eventually we came to a valley where we both thought, okay, this is probably um, the valley that we need to go up in order to, to, to get to the summit. And we also already saw the, 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 the silhouette of the mountain and we figured, okay, this could actually be our mountain so let's head up there the snow was very very deep and again we 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 switched the roles who was going in front in order to to make it easier for the other one again as i explained in the last video when the snow is very 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 steep it's very exhausting very taxing and um a lot uh, very energy consuming to to go up a mountain in, in deep snow and it's very very helpful to to switch the roles to have one guy go for 15 minutes or maybe half an hour or even longer as long as they can um, plow, th uh, plow through the snow and do the hard work and then to switch it up let the other one go in front let him do the hard work and the other member um, regenerates and rests while following in the footsteps and that's a very efficient way to go together in the mountains and to preserve or conserve energy and that's what we did and we, we fought our way up um, I remember Michal was stronger than me. I think, I don't know if he already trained for uh, uh, triathlons uh, during that time, but I remember he was very, very fit. He was very, very strong, uh, definitely stronger than I was and fitter than I was. So um, yeah, he was physically stronger and I was so glad to go with him and uh, that he was plowing through, through the snow. Sorry for the interruption guys, the play was so loud, the noise was so <laughs> annoying and actually the sun is so uh, strong, shining into my eyes now, uh, so I decided to get the glasses and uh, continue the story. So I remember Mikhail and I, we fought up the valley, again deep snow as I explained, and I remember we had different um, techniques of um, fighting our way through the snow. While Michal, for example, had a technique, he, he told himself in his mind, okay, let's do 20 steps, for example, then he was fighting 20 steps through the deep snow, and then he was um, resting and breathing a little, and after he was able to catch some breath again, uh, he continued for another 20 steps. And I remember that this was a Michal style of uh, moving forward, where my style was, um, I, I had a little bit of a slower pace, but a steady pace, and I just 
slowly plowed through the snow not as fast as he was but in a slow and steady manner without without breaks so yeah both of us uh, uh, we, we 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 managed to to bring us forward but we had um, different approaches which was uh, quite nice and quite funny uh, we took some breaks every now and then we ate a little we we drank uh, some water and yeah, we, we progressed upwards uh, the hill uh, as much as we as we could. I remember um, we've been sitting together. We were checking our, our shoes, our feet, and uh, deciding when we put on the crampons. And I remember that I still had traditional, uh, just normal plastic bottles of water attached to my to my rucksack, and I just took them the the, the old-fashioned way and uh, drank from them. But um, the, the 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 water already started to crystallize a little bit, so it was very very cold, but you could still drink it. And I remember um, back then it was kind of modern. Uh, Michael had this uh, this drinking tube. Um, like a camelback and I remember that his tube froze completely and he was unable to to drink um, from his camelback even though probably the water uh, uh, inside his rucksack at his back was liquid but the tube itself was frozen so he couldn't access um, the water and uh, so I shared uh, the water from my bottle with him and um, yeah that that was a moment for me where I realized wow so uh, new equipment or uh, modern equipment is not always uh, the, the best idea. I think nowadays they have insulation on those tubes, but still it's a, a common thing that can happen that the tube uh, can freeze and um, therefore it's sometimes good after you, you, you've been drinking from your, from your tube, from your camelback, that you like you, you, you um, blow some air inside in order to, to clean uh, the tube from the water so that there's only water in the tube whenever you have to drink and otherwise there's only air inside. But still that doesn't fix the problem 100%. The st uh, still the uh, tube can sometimes freeze and therefore it's recommended to have some kind of isolation or at least um, this is how I do it nowadays when I'm uh, uh, on the mountain when it's very very cold um, I try to keep some uh, uh, liquid some hot tea or whatever it is inside uh, my my uh, down suit or my jacket and that way my body warms it all the time so yeah we've been sitting there I shared uh, my water together with Michal I remember he uh, he even lost his, his glove once and it was very, very dangerous that um, he, he will lose his glove uh, entirely and completely and that would, would have meant that we have to turn around because otherwise uh, his, his hand would be freezing, you know. So he was, he was able to manage to, to, to grab his glove before it um, slides further down the mountain which was a little bit of a shock for him and yeah so after a while we looked at the pictures and we thought okay where do we have to go you know we we were both amateurs and we didn't know exactly how to get to the summit we didn't know the terrain we didn't have a guide so we had to find the way ourselves and we were looking at the at the pictures at the at the map and we figured out okay there's like an opening to the to the to the ridge on onto the saddle a little bit to the right there were a lot, was like a rocky formation and to the right we saw like a light, like a little path up there and that way we thought we can reach the saddle and from there we could then decide to go to the left side to the acute and to the right side to Afella north and Afella south and yeah our intuition uh, was right uh, we we managed to go up there and once we uh, reached the slope and we climbed up the slope we we, we reached a saddle and from there we had um, as we as we thought as our intuition um, told us or predicted there were two ways up to the left and to the right so we decided okay let's go left first let's go to the acute first and climb that 4000 the first and that's what we did up there after we, we we left the saddle the the wind was extremely strong i remember that we that we uh, escaped sometimes to a little like a snow hole where we were protected from the wind we took uh, took some pictures we sometimes when we were hungry or our blood sugar was dropping we we had some food some snacks some some nuts uh, to 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 fill up our energy 
and then yeah we uh, progressed further and further the wind got stronger um, the, the the snow um, was not deep and, and soft anymore it got hard you know and frozen and yeah after a while uh, the both of us we, we uh, managed to reach the summit of acute and uh, we climbed our second first, uh, uh, four thousander that day. Uh, I don't know if it was Mikael's second four thousander, but it was definitely my second four thousander. And we, we celebrated our first success. So we celebrated at the summit of Acute. We were super happy. Uh, we were hyped, we were excited and we were motivated to keep on. We were looking again uh, across uh, Morocco, across the, the uh, high Atlas mountain range. We were looking towards the south to uh, towards the Sahara. If we could see the Sahara, we were looking west. If we could see the Atlantic Ocean, we were looking over to Tupkal and Tupkal West and yeah, just celebrated the fact that we've been standing on Tupkal recently. Michal showed me other the other two 4000er summits. Uh, summits. Oh yeah, see, uh, so it wasn't his second 4000er. Uh, uh, he climbed the day before, um, which would be uh, uh, Tames Gida and Ras Ukunarim. And I would climb these two mountains the next day. So he already showed me uh, where the mountains are and uh, showed me the path. And yeah, we looked over uh, towards um, the north, you could say, yes. And we were looking at our next summits, which would be uh, Afela North and Afela South. And yeah, we already saw, okay, we need to go down to the saddle again. And from there, there would be a path um, up on the backside to the, to the mountain. And yeah, we thought, okay, there's probably a way to get there so yeah we we were excited we descended from the acute we were back at the saddle where we started and we moved over towards um, the way up to uh, Afela North and Afela South and I remember um, there was like a, 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 a little bit of a climbing section like a bottleneck and Michal uh, told me, hey, Nordin, you, you see this uh, little section? It was a little bit rocky. There was a little bit of a snow or ice tube there. And Michal said, I think we can climb up there. And I told Michal, yeah, I think so too. This looks like a possible way up to the two summits. But I said, I think if we go a little bit further around this, uh, the, the mountain, there's probably a very nice, like a highway, like a, uh, uh, yeah, just a, uh, just a slope up to, to, to the plateau. And I think there's an easier way to, to go up there. And I remember we were uh, discussing a little bit, but we didn't have a fight, but we were discussing a little bit which would be the best way and I agreed to say, okay, you know what, Michael, we're gonna we're gonna um, follow your suggestion. We're gonna climb this little uh, bottleneck tube thingy because from afar it it looked, yeah, quite quite easy. Even though it was a little bit steep, but um, it it looked manageable. And um, I agreed. Uh, it was in in still in my comfort zone in in the the amount of risk I would uh, I would take, and uh, therefore I agreed to that. That's a huge and very important part in mountaineering, especially if you go mountaineering together. Um, you always have to uh, judge and, and see how much risk adversity every member has. Some people like more risk, some people like less risk. Um, uh, uh, some people are comfortable with climbing exposed um, uh, passages and some don't and um, the sensitivity to risk and risk taking can differ a lot and the styles are very very different and um, you have to find a common ground in order to make the climb successful and in order to be happy and still feel comfortable with it. Because if you let yourself get pushed to something that is too risky for yourself, you will probably not enjoy it. And it's really important that you, you find the bottom line, or if not, that you then, then say, okay, um, I cannot do this. We, we either have to go, um, we have to, to split ways or turn around
around or yeah but um you you you, you shouldn't do something that you think is too risky for yourself on the other hand you always have to consider the fact that your mind is always playing tricks on you and sometimes dramatizes the things and uh, uh, climbing passages seem more risky than they are in reality but your mind is playing tricks on you so this is a little bit of a complex topic but in the end um, you have to uh, feel comfortable with the decision and be happy with the decision and um, that's what I was I, I, I knew there was probably an easier way up to the plateau but um, I was also okay um, with going that route and yeah so we we started traversing from the saddle uh to the the to the back side of the mountain and we started climbing up to uh yeah the 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 the, the rock and ice face it was a little bit of a mixed terrain it was a little bit mixed of rock snow and ice and the higher we climbed the steeper it got and eventually we ended up at the bottleneck and uh, once we were standing close to the bottleneck, uh, we had to figure out that it was very, very steep. It was even a little bit with an overhang. And due to the fact that it was like a bottleneck and that during the day, the snow was sometimes a little bit uh, uh, melting up there and um, uh, flowing down, that some parts of it were even icy and it was not super easy to go up there. No, it was actually uh, um, a little bit, hard and difficult to go up there i think if i if i would have to grade it uh i think the german scale is it a uiaa scale i don't remember sorry guys but if i would have to grade it in in, in german terms i would probably grade it like a four or five which is not super difficult to climb but um behind us was a steep rock face and falling would mean death that was for, for sure or at least serious serious injury so falling was not an option at all and could have been uh, deadly and climbing four or five grade in mixed rock ice uh, terrain as a beginner is not an easy thing and uh, quite scary if you ask me and still is so I remember um, Michal got a little bit nervous. Hey man, what can we do? Because we couldn't really turn around. Um, because turning around was not really an option. It was too steep and too exposed and too icy. So climbing down was not an option. There was only one option and that was to manage this climbing section to get across this bottleneck and, and icy tube. And f this would be... Um, our our way out of this uh, situation and um yeah i remember i remember my my ice axe i didn't use uh, use my ice, ice axe yet it was still attached to my rucksack and i was the only one ha carrying an ice axe with me and um, i remember i turned around to michael and said okay michael let's relax now let's calm down we're gonna do this very 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 methodical there's only this one way up and we're gonna climb this way up but um give me some time i'm gonna i'm gonna prepare uh i'm gonna prepare something so as i told you uh michael was definitely the the stronger of of the two of us so he was physically uh, definitely stronger than i was but I think due to the fact that I had this glacier course just before I went to Morocco, I was able to learn a little bit of technical skills and actually I learned how to prepare an, an ice wall, how to climb an ice wall and how to um, yeah, build some steps in an icy wall and that's exactly what I did. So I put down my rucksack even though it was a very 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 narrow uh, rock phase and it was mixed rock and ice. I um, put down my rucksack, I got my ice axe out, attached it to my, to my, um, to my hand put my rucksack on again and then I started to hammer away at the ice, at this ice tube uh, in this bottleneck and I did a little like triangular steps into the ice just as I learned it the weeks before in that glacier course and that way I was able to build some ice steps, triangular steps into, into this um, bottleneck and slowly climb upwards. I was able to um, ram my ice axe up you know get a good hold climb up with the crampons have a good stand and then i could uh, once i had a good grip 
with three points, then I could um, make another step and that way climb up until there was the, the last part, like um, this overhang part that I just described. And I took my ice axe, the, the upper part was frozen and I took my ice axe and I, I, I slammed it in the upper part and it was like a, like a handle. The, 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 the ice axe was very, very, the, the, the way it sunk into the ice was very satisfying. It was very, 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 a very firm grip and a good hold and I knew, okay, this would definitely hold my entire weight with my rucksack. So I could rely on this grip, uh, even though it was like a little bit of an overhang. It was there, up there in the ice. And yeah, I pulled myself up because I knew this would be the last pull. And after this uh, last um, pull, I would be on, on, the, on, the, on the top slope, on the snow, and I would be out of the situation. And then I could uh, turn around and um, help Michal or at least um, give him the ice axe so he could follow me. And I remember because of the fact I was physically not strong enough and I was still a rookie and um, especially my upper body was very, very weak. I remember when I pulled myself up with all the weight from my rucksack and me still being too heavy, um, I almost got like a, a, like a cramp in my in my right shoulder and i remember thinking about oh no my, my 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 right shoulder cannot collapse now if i cannot hold this grip i'm gonna fall and this is probably gonna gonna spell the end for me so i even though there was like this cramp in my shoulder i had to pull through and i somehow yeah managed my uh, to 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 pull myself up this uh, little icy overhang and I was sitting in the snow and I was I was safe up there and I, I managed to to climb the passage and um, yeah I I think I looked back to Michal I kept the ice axe where it was I looked back to Michal and um, yeah then he started the climb and um, climbed the same way up that I just prepared for us after this little nerve-wracking passage, uh, we were quite happy that we managed to do that. And I remember that Michal turned to me and I think he apologized and said, uh, I'm sorry that he pushed me to do this, that he pushed the both of us to climb this section and not to go around the mountain as I suggested it and maybe to find an easier way. And I told Michal in this situation, hey Michal, there's nothing to say uh, I'm sorry for. Um, we discussed this. Both of us, we agreed to it, even though I had another option in mind, but I agreed to your um, version of climbing it, to your option, and therefore there's no, uh, nothing to, to apologize for, because we, in the end, even though it was his idea to go that way, in the end, we took this decision together and so he wouldn't have to apologize for it. So I said, no, I, I decided that together with you beforehand that it is okay for me to climb the section and um, this is what it is. And I'm not the one gonna, gonna complain why we ended up in this hard situation or whatever. No, we took this uh, decision together. So um, we fight our way together through this decision and no one has to be sorry or apologize to the other one. So that was... Um, what I told him and uh, yeah after that we kept on walking we already could see um, that uh, the slope would lead up and uh, it would lead us to a plateau and after maybe 10 minutes of walking through the snow we ended up in Afella South uh, our our second 4000er that day my personal third 4000 and I don't know, probably the fifth for Michal. And yeah, we, we, we had another success and we were super, super happy. Uh, again, we were standing there, the weather was great, um, even though it was quite windy, but it was, just, it was just a celebration for the two of us and we had a great time. And we could already see when we were looking to the north that there was a fella nord and we would just have to go along the plateau uh, and climb a little bit of a ridge and we then would reach a fella north so yeah after posing a little bit and doing uh, shooting some pictures we started moving along the plateau towards a fella north
After a fella, what was it, south, um, we walked along the plateau, um, then we had to climb a little bit off a ridge, and I think after 30 to 40 minutes, um, we reached our next 4000, which was a fella north. Uh, maybe I mixed them up. But yeah, basically we, we uh, moved to the other summit of Afella and by that we managed to climb Afella North and Afella South. And uh, yeah, we uh, managed to reach our third summit, uh, our third 4000 that day. And uh, yeah, both of us, we were super happy and we realized that we had the same mindset, the same attitude, the same way of climbing um that we had the same energy and uh, motivation in us and our crisis management and also the way of dealing with the cold with the with the snow and everything we we, we figured out that we that we fit quite well together there was a lot of harmony between the, the two of us and we really enjoyed climbing together and uh yeah it was a it was a great day so standing at the summit of um, the two Afellas, we then looked further to the north. Um, if we could recognize um, the last mountain, the last summit, Bigunne Sen, and we saw a very, very, very razor sharp ridge. Um, it was completely covered in snow and, you know, due to the strong winds, there was the, the 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 snow really looked intimidating on the ridge and we really thought okay um we are kind of running out of time we don't know how much longer we have sunlight we still have to find a way down the summit because we didn't we couldn't we 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 realized we couldn't go the same way down that we came up the bottleneck and we would have to find another way down and um yeah, so we were looking over to the ridge, we, we saw it looked very, very, very exposed and we felt like, okay, maybe maybe we cannot go over to Bigono Sen and maybe we should start descending so we don't arrive too late and we still have sunlight left when we, when we have to descend. And that's what we did, but then again, you know, we didn't, we were not able to take the way back that we came up because it was way too steep and too icy, no chance to climb that down even we came up that way, but we didn't have a rope, we didn't have ice crews or a harness or anything with us. It was really just my ice axe and we had crampons and that's it, we had nothing else with us because both of us, we were greenhorns, didn't know what we were doing. And yeah, we had to find a way to get down from this 4000er and we didn't really know which way to go. So I remember we started, uh, we split up a little bit and we, um, we were both uh, searching for a way down. Because we remembered when we looked up that there were like slopes uh, down to the valley that we, uh, where we, we came from. And we thought, okay, we can probably split up and look for a slope down so we can go or get back to the valley that we came from. So yeah, the two of us, we kept on climbing down more or less on our own, but every now and then we, 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 we connected again. I remember that we've been shouting at each other like, hey, Nordine, I have a way down. Yeah, Mikael, I also have a way down. Okay, let's, let's meet up down here and so on. And I remember that we kind of moved on different paths down the, 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 the rock face. But that was quite tricky, you know, everything was covered in snow, in deep snow. It was quite dangerous and, um, you know, it could just happen or it sometimes happened that we just reached a ledge and there was just a super steep rock face down that you could not climb and then you would have to search again left and right and see if there's somewhere like a, not a, too steep of a path um, covered in snow that we could probably climb down and um, yeah it was quite tricky actually to find that and uh, it took us quite a lot of time to, to find the way down the mountain and yeah I just remember some sections we walked together some sections we split up we basically um, yeah just multiplied our resources and our eyes in order to find the way down and somehow what ha what ended up happening is that both of us we found a way down and we 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 moved down and then we came together again
and yeah so that worked better than expected because i was a little bit worried if we would find a way down actually uh, that that mountain face because it was quite steep I'll, I'll check if i can find a picture that i can 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 show so yeah after a while i remember you know that the slope got uh, less and less steep and yeah we ended up in that side valley again that we started and we had just a great time and we had a different uh, way of climbing down and i remember again um Michael climbed down the left way of the valley, I climbed down the right side of the valley, but um, yeah, we were, we, we, we were always in contact with each other. When I was, when I was shouting at Michal, I could still hear him and, uh, I could, uh, and he could still hear me. So we were still communicating, but we were running down the valley together on our own separate paths and that was also nice. So the both of us, um, we figured out we are kind of in individualist, we are both solo mountaineers but still again we enjoyed climbing together it was it was kind of like a solo duo uh, experience which is quite nice and which i enjoyed quite a lot climbing together with Mikael. and um yeah at the end we ended up again together in the in the in the main valley where the refuge is and i think we just had to walk down one more hour together the valley and we ended up at the hut at the refuge Tupkal. Um, the, the hut manager and the cook uh, and uh, another uh, small guy, a helper named Ismail. Uh, the, the three of them, they were waiting for us. You know, we were the crazy guys climbing alone without a guide. All the other guys that were on the, on the, on the hut in the refuge, you know, they were only climbing with the guides or were not climbing at all because they didn't dare to go into the snow. And the two of us, we didn't care about anything we just went out and we, we we reached summit after summit and yeah that was great and yeah they were a little bit worried if we if we come back so they already kept looking for us and they were quite relieved when they saw that we came back and yeah at the end of the day maybe one hour or two hours before the the, the sunset we uh, arrived back at the hut and we celebrated just another great day um, of climbing and reaching more for a thousand is together and we enjoyed it so much climbing together so yeah um, what we did is Michal and I we uh, immediately we exchanged numbers Facebook contact I don't know what you did that time I think back then the most common thing was to exchange Facebook uh, uh, contacts and that way you could stay uh, stay in touch and in contact and that's what we did because Michal was running out of time he had to descend and go to go down to Imlil and to Marrakesh the next day because um, he had to meet up with his girlfriend and then fly back to the UK. And um, yeah, I still had plenty of time and I could still go on climbing. And um, yeah, that's why we connected. And yeah, we had dinner together. We celebrated the, the, the day in the, in the little uh, oven and kitchen room. We had a great evening together. We... Um, talked about so many plans for the future and um, yeah I said goodbye to Michal we went to bed and um, the next day Michal would go down go down to Imlil and I would then go to climb uh, two more four thousanders that Michal climbed the previous day he already descended to Imlil and I was completely on my own now. I think it was like maybe 5 a.m. in the morning, maybe it was 6 a.m., I don't remember exactly anymore. Again, I didn't start uh, at complete night, uh, but I waited a little bit until the sun started, uh, the sunrise started a little bit and the sky was uh, like dark gray. And that's when I started, so I knew, okay, I could see a little bit and i started moving south again because uh yeah uh on the map and after discussion with Mikhail, i knew okay where to go and uh, how to to find the route to go to the next two uh, four thousanders they would be called uh, times gida and ras ukunarim and this time i would really be uh, on my own 
It's not like on Tupkal before where another group of climbers was with me on the mountain. It would not be like the day before where I would go with Mikael together. No, this time I would be completely on my own. I would have to find the way all by myself and climb the 4000ers all on my own, completely by myself and find the route. And um, yeah, again, I was a little bit worried if I would be able to find the way, but I thought, yeah. The last two days they were so great and uh, my intuition was good because, you know, back then I, I didn't know if I could trust my guts, if I could trust my intuition. Every now and then I had a little bit of experience gathered, like, okay, I guess my intuition is not bad. It seems that I have a naturally good feeling for the right way, the right path. Um, somehow I, I, I felt that in me, that I, I, I had an eye for the mountain, I would say. And I, I, even though I got lost sometimes uh, as well, I have to, to mention that as well. But it seemed like I have I had good intuition. So I, th I said, okay, let's let's go and see uh, if my intuition will also get me to the next two summits. So I started going towards the south. And I remember it goes up and up and up and up, like actually until the end of the valley. And then you end up in like a saddle and a sudden drop towards the south. Uh, and if you go further south, uh, there you, you reach the, the Lac Ifni. And I was looking to the right. I knew I had to go to the right. I saw it on the maps uh, and on the pictures. And I remember, yeah, I think I remember on the pictures, on Michal's uh, black and white pictures, I saw there was like a formation, like three rocks standing there, like, like some kind of stone figures. And I remember uh, that I was able to recognize those stone figures and that I would have to go between the two rightmost stone figures and that there's like a snow slope and I would have to climb or uh, go through that s uh, snow slope and then I would reach the summit of which one was the first one. I think the first one was Ras Ukunarim, but I don't know if I mix them up if the first one is Ras or, or uh, Tames Gida. So yeah, I was able to, to find my way up. I, I, was, I saw, I recognized the stones and then I went through the stones and I found myself on the way up to the to the summit, to the plateau. And I could already see when I reached the plateau that there it, it got more and more flat and um, there was like a, a huge stone pile at the summit and I knew okay hey this is this is the summit already and um, actually with not a lot of effort um, even though I had to fight my way through the through the snow again of course all by myself but yeah, I was so motivated that the last two successful day, days just boosted my confidence and my, my, my self-esteem so much. So I was completely, my, my energy tank was full to the top and it was rushing through the snow and it was full of energy, really. I was like, like on drugs, like on, like on, 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 on ecstasy. My, my whole system was probably full with uh, dopamine and uh, uh, luck hormones and yeah I was just plowing through the snow like a madman and I was so happy and I felt so strong and I didn't feel any kind of exhaustion at all standing on that summit and I was celebrating and I could already see the next summit the 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 time is Gida or Ras Ukunarim I don't know what the second summit was called uh, I could already see it in the distance and I saw yeah this is it's a it's a piece of cake even though I had to descend quite a lot again and then go up the mountain again but I had so much energy in my system I could already see the path to the next summit and I was so so hyped and again I looked back to the other summit that we climbed the day before uh, the um, the acute Afella North Afella South I saw over the Tupkal uh, I was standing on one of the 4000 I could already see my next 4000 I was looking over to Tupkal because I saw okay there's another 4000 I wanted to climb the Tupkal West uh, which I didn't climb uh, the first time and yeah the weather was again great the sun was shining the sky was blue the clouds were below me and I had a great day and I, I remember I was even freaking out a little bit talking to the camera and uh, sending a video back to my family well i was recording the video and then i would send it back to my family once i would be back down in uh, in imlil or in marrakesh 
So yeah, after celebrating my first summit, I started to go to uh, Ras Ukunarim. I was going down the slope, up the hill again. The, the wind was so strong up there that again the snow was not deep anymore. Um, it was the, the, the deep snow was blown away and the, the frozen snow was left behind. And when, once I got to the, to the summit plateau of Ras Okunarim, there were hundreds and thousands of cairns, like little stone figures people put up together. I don't know how many there they were, but there were a lot. The whole plateau of the summit was full with the stone figures and i was running around uh, at the summit area and i was celebrating so much and i was at the i would say it was the most southern point of the 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 the, the high atlas region or at least the most southern 4000er of the, the the atlas region and i could look further to the south where uh the the, the sahara desert would be and i remember looking to the south and i'm i was trying to see if i could recognize the Sahara Desert if I could see maybe like a yellow band of sand or a, a strip of sand or anything that would maybe signal that there is the Sahara Desert but I remember that time of the year I think I was not able to really see the Sahara Desert maybe if you zoom in the pictures um, you can see the Sahara Desert in the in the uh, far distance uh, but yeah, I wasn't able to recognize it back then, I remember. So yeah, after celebrating at the summit, you know, that would, that was now Tupkal, Afela North, Afela South, the Akut, Tamesgida and Ras, uh, Ras Ukunarium. Did I count six or seven? Doesn't even matter. But I just climbed so many 4000ers and I was so hyped and I, I knew there were more 4000ers four, uh, four, four uh, uh, in this, in this uh, mountain range and I was so hyped to climb even more because I felt so strong and energetic. So I sta uh, started walking back to the refuge again, to the uh, refuge Tupkal, coming back from the valley. Again, Hassan, Ismail and Mohammed were waiting for me, uh, a little bit worried again if I come back. Um, because you know, being in the circumstances with this high, with this snow masses, and yeah, they were happy to see that I came back. I was happy. It was still early in the day, you know. It wasn't. It was still a long time till sun sunset, and yeah, I was just super happy, you know, that I that I um, managed to climb more four thousanders.
so again the same uh, evening i was sitting in the in the in the in the kitchen and oven room um i was checking the map again looking for more 4000ers in the region that i could climb and i remember i was running out of money i had no cash left because i had to pay the meals i had to pay the nights in the hut and i was running out of cash uh, because i didn't didn't uh, withdraw enough uh, cash from my bank account and i wouldn't be able to um, pay my bill if i stayed up longer up there if i spent another night and paid more meals and breakfast so i told hassan hey hassan actually in order to stay longer up here i need to go down and get more cash do you know where the next atm is and he laughed at me and said yeah actually you have to go down to imlil go to a car or a taxi get a taxi and go to a little village called a uh, I don't remember anymore. I, th I think I will write it in, in, in the screen. But yeah, I would have to go down and uh, drive with a taxi away from Imlil to find a, a bank, to find an ATM in order to continue my climb. So yeah, I was, I was laughing. I told, uh, I think his name was Hassan. I said, okay, Hassan, you know what? I will leave my equipment here most of it, uh, the heavy stuff, like my tent and so on. And I will leave the stuff here. I will run down to Imlil the next day and get some more cash. And this is what I did the next day in the morning, even though I wanted to keep on climbing more 4,000ers, but I had to get, uh, get some more cash first. So I decided to run down all the way down to Imlil. And uh, yeah, that time it felt amazing. You know, guys, I've been, up there at 4,000 meters plus for three or four days now, my body was completely acclimatized to the height, to the altitude. And, you know, my body was so strong, you know, because I was constantly out there in the mountains fighting through the snow. And I remember running down to Imlil like a madman. I, I felt as if I had springs in my legs, you know, I felt that I had so much power, I had so much energy and I was running down to Imlil like and I felt so strong and fit like I never felt before and just after a short walk just a few hours I arrived down in Imlil uh, I, I, I met Brahim in his little hostel and um, I told him in excitement what I did and that I need to get some cash and he said yeah come on let me let me call a friend he can drive you to the to the next town and there you can withdraw some money and that's what i did i think i had a little bit of a of a, of a lunch uh, at uh, at brahim's house ran down in imlil to the taxi stand drove with the car to the next place where there would be an atm uh, I was withdrawing some money. I don't remember how much I was withdrawing, but just enough so I could stay a few more days up there and pay my bill and pay for the food and meals and also to stay at Brahim's place. Um, yeah, I remember I had to wait for the taxi driver to take me back to Imlil. And in the meantime, there was some kind of street stand, typical Moroccan street food, some kind of of lamp grilled and yeah i think i had some grilled lamp next to the street there after i withdrew my money and the taxi driver came back and it already got dark and we drove back to imlil together in imlil i would then again go to to uh, brahim's house and uh, have dinner at brahim's house and uh, yeah talk a little bit more with brahim and yeah, I think, ah, yeah, I remember um, I wasn't the only guest that night in Brahim's house. There was another guy called Jean. Uh, he was from France and he was together with, uh, with his uh, Germ uh, German girlfriend. And they also wanted to climb the Tupkal. And he was coming with a, with, a, with a paragliding, how do you say, paraglide, paraglide, whatever it is. Um, yeah, he wanted to paraglide off from uh, from Tupkal together with his girlfriend. I met him and we we had dinner together in in, in Brahim's uh, little uh, hostel, and yeah, we had a great conversation. And the next day, I went to bed and 
the three of us, we would climb up, but um, they had a lot of heavy equipment. They were starting a little bit later and I was completely energized. I was full with energy, dopamine and motivation and I just ran up to the uh, refuge again, to where the hut is like a madman. I don't know how long it took me, but this time I felt so strong. And also I didn't have the heavy rucksack this time, not the heavy tent and my stove and everything. So I was so much faster and I was running up like a madman to the refuge until I reached the refuge. And yeah, there I was again. And I remember Hassan, uh, Mohammed and Ismail, they were laughing at me that I was there again. And uh, yeah, I spent the night there and I told them, hey guys, next day I want to climb Tupkal West. That was one of the 4000s that was still missing. I want to climb Tupkal West next. Then I'm going to climb Tupkal again, Jebel Tupkal, the highest mountain of Morocco. And from there, there you could reach a quite tricky 4000 that is called Imuzer. The Imuzer is only a 4,100 or 4,080 meters high and you would have once you reach the Tupkal you would have to climb down and climb along a ridge and um, I didn't really know how to find it and I remember I even talked to Brahim down there hey Brahim can you explain me how I can find the way to the Imuser because I was st uh, studying the map and I didn't really find a way how to to find this 4000 er and um, yeah no one really could tell me how to find the summit so yeah I kept on studying the map and prepared everything for the next day and went to bed and the next morning I got up early again this time again in the night because I knew okay Tupkal is quite high and I, uh, I will try to climb three four thousanders again and climb down an alter alternative route so I will have to go up very very early in order to not get into time trouble. It was kind of used. Um, I had the routine already. I was going, getting up early in the morning. I was having my breakfast and I was getting ready, putting my rucksack on my shoulders, my little head lamp and activated. And then I stepped out into the ice, into the snow, into the darkness. And I moved up the way again to Tupkal, where I've been uh, heading to four days earlier, I think. Um, I went up the, the valley to the Tupkal, this time all by myself, all alone, fighting up again. And then I realized, okay, the Tupkal West is also another 4000 but not the Tupkal itself, um, is to the right side. And I didn't really know where the way is. I could have gone all the way up to the, to the saddle and then go right, but that would have meant that I I uh, lose a lot of time and distance and uh, it was a rather inefficient way of climbing because I had to go back and forth the same way twice. So I decided uh, when I wasn't the in the valley, I looked to the right and I saw like a, like a, like a, like a rock face, like a slope up to Tupkal West. And I thought, okay, I think um, this is doable. This is manageable to climb that. And I just turned 90 degrees to the right and decided to climb up the wall directly to, uh, to watch Tupkal West. And that's uh, what I ended up doing. It was very, very steep, uh, but I was quite confident that I can do it. Um, I think it's not a standard path or way that you go usually up there. But I was confident that I can find the way and there was so much snow and I felt comfortable with the snow actually and yeah I climbed up I had to climb a little bit uh, in snow in in rock so a little bit of mixed terrain and yeah I think after an hour or one hour and a half I reached the ridge of the Tupkal West and I remember it was extremely windy. The wind that day was super, super strong, especially early in the morning. The, the wind was very, very strong. This is a phenomenon a phenomena I, I observed back then in the mountains that um, just when the sunrise happens, it seems like, I don't know, the air convection is starting or the, well, what I observed is that the, the winds get stronger um, just 
when the sunrise happens. So yeah, that happened again this day, and I was standing at the at the ridge uh, of the Tupkal West, and I was I, I was able to see the summit already in like uh, twenty to thirty minute distance. It will, would just be a little bit of a little ridge climb, and I would be able to reach the summit of the Tupkal West, and that's what I did. And uh, yeah, I remember I, reaching the Tupkal West, the summit. I again hit my next 4000 a mountain i was so happy but i remember recording a video i couldn't even talk to the camera because the wind was so immensely strong i was looking over to the tupkal and to the other 4000ers and i was just amazed you know looking around me seeing all the 4000ers that i climbed recently and um now i was standing on the tupkal west and there was only one more 4000er left that i would have to climb in this region and then I probably would have climbed all possible 4000ers in this region and I was so hyped but it was so cold and so windy so I put back the the camera I remember that my hand got super super cold even in the in the in the gloves it was hard to to keep my my hands warm and I knew the only option that I have is I need to move and move and move and move and move faster so I get warm eventually and that's what I did put away my camera or my phone I don't remember anymore and had to climb down the ridge a little bit back to the the well would you call it a saddle well back to the ridge where I was standing the first time where I teared up when I saw the clouds below me and the beautiful nature I remember I was standing at this at, at this point again after I came down from the Tupkal West and to the left side I could see again Tupkal and I, w I, I knew okay it's just not a long distance anymore and I would be standing at the summit of Tupkal the second time and that's what I did. This time I felt so much more routine uh, and I felt so much more confidence and so much more, uh, so much stronger. And yeah, I moved towards the Tupkal and after an hour, I think I was standing at the summit of Tupkal again. And uh, I was celebrating again, looking to the other summits, but I had only one thing in mind and that was the last 4000er that was missing. Imuzer and I was I was looking you know to the left side I saw a ridge and I saw a super narrow narrow uh, mountains and like a like a ridge and I really didn't know man which one of these mountains is the Imuzer I really I was kind of confused and I remember another group came up to the Tupkal and one Moroccan guide and um, you know everything is covered in snow and you couldn't see anything and going down uh, a, a slope or a, a rock face could be super dangerous because you could you could you could um, fall down um, the rock face you know uh, and yeah it was quite dangerous to walk in this terrain and I remember I, I asked one of the guides and I told him hey man I'm looking for the Imuzer can you tell me where and how I go down to the right side of the mountain and how I can find it and I remember he he pointed one direction and it was just a super steep uh, slope or well rock face covered in snow down and he said yeah the, the Imuzer climb down that way and then to the right side you will see it and I was a little bit scared but I was uh, I was determined to climb all the 4000ers in that region and yeah that's what I did I I said goodbye to the guys and I just climbed down the 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 mountain the the snow path slope however you want to call it I don't know how to describe it and I remember after a while it 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 uh, went down like this through deep snow and I remember it got a little bit like a it it wasn't like a little uh, like a plateau maybe like a little triangle shaped plateau there was one way to the left one way up to Tupkal and one very narrow path to the right and I could see a summit or two summits in the distance after a little bit of a uh, rich climb and I thought man this looks tricky and I decided okay I will try to climb this ridge a little bit 
and see if I can reach this one summit that I think is the summit. And yeah, then I, I started climbing and everything was in deep snow and it was very, very, very exposed. You know, it was the, the rock face was falling down a few hundred meters to the left and to the right. It was very dangerous and very exposed and uh, I did my best to climb to this uh, summit that I found. And yeah, I think uh, as far as I can tell, uh, I was standing on the summit of the Imuzer, the final 4000er in the high atlas region and I was so happy. But I was quite scared because it looked super, super, super exposed. And really one, one wrong step, I would fall, I would slip. And um, yeah, if I would fall, I would definitely be dead. And um, yeah, I was quite scared and I would have to climb back the way I came from. So yeah, I came back to this little triangle shaped plateau and then I had two options. I was looking at the map. I could either go up to the Tupkal again and climb down the normal way or I could um, keep on to the left side because I looked at the map and uh, on the map I saw a little star and uh, on that little star there was a number 3700 something and a mountain called Tibertine and I decided okay um, I saw the valley if I go down that way connects again to the main valley where the, the refuge is. So I decided, okay, I think I can find a way there. I can go along the plateau to the ridge down to the Tiberhine that is like 200 meters below me at 3,700 something meters. I could go to that next summit, another 3,000 mountain, see what this little star means on the map and then go down the, the, the snow slope go to the main valley and then climb up to the refuge again. And that's what I did. I climbed along the ridge and, but this time it was not as exhausting because, you know, I had to climb down, even though I had to be very careful. And yeah, I went down to the saddle again and then I had to climb up again to the Tiberhine. And I remember I reached the summit of Tiberhine and suddenly there was like a, plane engine a completely wrecked plane engine i think from maybe the 1920s or 1930s i don't remember exactly but yeah there was a, a plane wreck on the summit and later on i asked them what happened there and they tried to explain me that that was a plane crash yo yo <clears throat> also ich habe heute meine letzten 4000er gemacht. Da oben ist der große Vorfall. Das ist glaube ich der Akute, den ich vorhin gemacht habe. Alter Falter, das sieht aus, als wenn hier irgendwie in Wellen gekratzt ist. Okay, ich hab genug Rest. Ich geh wieder runter. Sehr stolz. Ja, warte. Ich will noch mal einmal runter ins Dorf. Hey, das ist der ganze Weg runter bis nach Emilien. Der Plane crashed in the Tukal, in the, in the High Atlas. And I happened to stand on this summit and I saw the plane wreck while I was standing on the summit. And now I kn knew why there was a star on the map that was marking the location of the wreck. And I was so surprised, you know, because I didn't expect a full engine, a full wreck, uh, uh, engine wreck at the summit of the Tiberhine. And uh, yeah, it was just amazing. You know, the wind slowed down, the sun came up, the weather was great sky was blue again it was such a phenomenal day and i had such a great day down, uh, out there in the mountains and i just i was so happy and celebrating you know and uh, i was alone in the mountains and it felt like a dream come true i was climbing one four thousand after another i was walking in the snow in the rocks i was climbing ridges um climbing up steep rock and ice and snow faces and down and I just feel felt great and that was all I 
ever wanted and finally i i reached this realm of mountaineering of 4000 mountain climbing even though it was not in the alps and even though it was not the super high intense and very technical rock and ice mountaineering that i would like to do in the in the alps but this was a first step you know i was above 4000 meters i was in rock and ice and snow and i was so happy with what happened and how much i learned uh, and yeah with this feeling you know with a, a huge chest and uh, uh, wide shoulders i was running down from the from the tiberhine summit back to the uh, you know the, the the snow slope and yeah i remember running down with big steps with my ice axe in one hand with the crampons with my gloves and i was running down the snow going down to the to the um big valley where the refuge would be you know and actually just as i intended you know i ended up in the big valley and then i would have to climb up a little bit the valley to reach the re refuge again and i was also so happy with my navigation skills you know because i knew exactly where i was going i reached every point i wanted to reach of course i used the map but i i was really using traditional tools like map and compass to navigate myself and it worked so well like the the map reading and my intuition was so it was i was so happy because it actually worked i got to the places i wanted to be and i i didn't mess up i didn't get lost and that gave me such a huge boost of confidence and yeah at the end of the day i ended up at the refuge again and had just another great day of success and i officially I think, even though I don't know if Bigger Sen was a 4000er or not, I didn't climb Bigger Sen that time, but yeah, I more or less climbed all the 4000ers around the Tubkal area and I was so happy. And I remember Mohammed, Ismail and um, uh, Hassan, you know, they were celebrating with me. They were happy for me that I was able to reach all the 4000ers. I was super excited and um, yeah. I had a great time so the next day I packed all my equipment I said farewell and goodbye to the three guys managing the hut and then I ran down to Imlil back to Brahim and yeah I told him everything and um, he asked me how it went and I told him everything how successful everything was how i was able to reach all the four thousanders and brahim was so proud and he was so happy so brahim took me with him and we went down to the mountain guides that um, told me days before that it's impossible to climb even Tupkal or any of the four thousanders and that i would die and he went there together with me and yeah he showed off a little bit and he told them hey guys look at him he climbed all the four thousanders and you as guides you didn't dare to climb up there you refused to go up and you were scared to death uh, to not go up there and this this uh, little greenhorn just showed you that it's possible and yeah he was making uh, fun uh, of the, the 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 mountain guides of Imlil and uh, bragging a little bit and yeah we had a great time and we were celebrating and yeah i think i spent one more night in uh, brahim's ho uh, hostel and the next day i i said farewell i said goodbye and i took the taxi from Imlil to Marrakesh but this wouldn't be the end of the journey because Brahim told me hey Nordin over there on the other side of the high atlas which is called the anti atlas there is one more 4000er it's called Jebel Mgun it's a very 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 beautiful area there um, they call it the, the, the happy valley or the lucky valley it's super beautiful, it's very remote and you really should also try to climb that for a thousander as well and then you would really have and then you would then you would have accomplished to climb all the four thousanders that are available to climb in Morocco and yeah with that idea in mind I got in the taxi and drove back to Marrakesh